Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, the topic we're discussing today is heaven, and this is episode number eight. Uh, each of the episodes are about two hours long, so if you, if you haven't seen the first seven, they're available on uh, my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. We're going to pick up where we left off last, last time. We're working our way through Randy Alcorn's book. Uh, the title of the book is Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Uh, and first, let's have the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, Eric? Uh, yeah, this is Eric. Uh, YouTube channel is Jesus Knight 72 And as I say always, I'm happy and blessed to be here. Okay, thank you, Eric. And Mitch? Brother Mitch here. Um, you can find me, Mitchell Bellenkoff, on. Uh, on Luke's channel, if, if you wish. Um, very happy to be here also. Okay, thank you guys for joining me. And now uh, in the book, we're actually on page uh, 100, I guess. We're making good progress here. There's about 480 pages, so we're probably um, over 20% of the way through. Uh, there's a lot to be said and a lot to learn about heaven, and that's the first surprising thing, is that most people in Christianity really know very little about heaven and the sad part is <laughs> many of them don't really have a lot of desire to learn a lot about heaven but uh, uh, we've been saying over and over again there is no more uh, interesting topic than heaven and it's it there's nothing more important to understand what our future holds for us for those of us who put our faith in our Savior Jesus Christ so let's uh, I'll start here on uh, page 100 I guess uh, uh, it says, taking our inheritance. Our, in, our, our interest in the end times usually extends to the period immediately preceding and following the return of Christ. But God's plan culminates after the final judgment, when King Jesus says, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's Matthew 25, verse 34. Where is this kingdom? Exactly where it has been from the beginning on earth. So, you know, we've, we've already talked quite a bit about this whole idea that this kingdom is going to be on earth. What, you guys want to say anything about that before we go deeper into this? I think we've covered it pretty much. Yeah. Uh, the, to me, the most interesting thing about it being on earth, since we're already aware of that, it, the interesting thing is that uh, very, very few Christians have any idea that they're going to be spending eternity on earth, not in off in the sky somewhere. <laughs> uh, so he says, um, what is the inheritance Jesus speaks of? Just as the children of king, uh, kings inherit kingdoms, the kingdoms consist of land and property, so earth is humanity's God-given property. God hasn't changed his mind. He hasn't fallen back to plan B or abandoned what he originally intended for us at the creation of the world. When Christ says, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world, it's as if he's saying, this is what I wanted for you all along. This is what I went to the cross and defeated death to give you. Take it, rule it, exercise dominion, enjoy it, and in doing so, Share my happiness. So, yeah, this is another point he made. We discussed this a little bit last time. Is that uh, uh, it's not it's not a plan B. Uh, it's uh, it was his plan all along for us to uh, live with God on the earth. Adam and Eve lived with God on earth. Uh, God walked with them. They had fellowship together in, in paradise, the Garden of Eden. That was the way God intended it, and in the end, that's where it will be for, for us who trust our Savior Jesus. Uh, God doesn't throw away his handiwork and start from scratch. Instead, he uses the same canvas to repair and make more beautiful the painting marred by the vandal. The vandal doesn't get the satisfaction of destroying his rival's masterpiece. On the contrary, God makes an even greater masterpiece out of what his enemy sought to destroy. Satan wants us to give up on God, on our purpose and calling, and on our planet. God reminds us, quote, 
the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. That's 1 John 4.4. 4. Satan seeks to destroy the earth. God seeks to restore and renew the earth, rule it, and hand it back over to his children. God will win the battle for us and for the earth. Yeah. So, this is, uh, this is much more than just... Uh, Dying and going to heaven and living in the in the clouds and playing a harp and and uh, saying hallelujah and singing in the choir you know there, there's there's much more of a, a substantial reality we'll have real bodies living on the real earth but we will be be re, uh, re, uh, resurrected re uh, reassembled with a glorified body that's like a Superman's body instead of the old body that is much more limited and frail and becomes sick. No, uh, we'll have a perfect body that lives forever in a perfect world without, you know, no more death, pain, sorrow. All right. Um, uniting heaven and earth. God's plan of the ages is to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, uh, even Christ. That's Ephesians 1.10. All things is broad and inclusive. Nothing will be left out. This verse corresponds precisely to the culmination of history that we see enacted in Revelation chapter 21. The merging together of the once separate realms of heaven and earth fully under Christ's Lordship. Uh, you know, I've read the whole book and I've read ahead. I know where he's going with all this, but th with this idea of all things is something that we're going to really uh, go into much more depth on, but uh, it's not just that he's going to give us these glorified bodies that never get sick or get old, or, uh, but the bodies need a place to live. <laughs> he's going to give us a glorified, resurrected earth too, a paradise on earth, and all things of, on all, all of creation will be restored, rebuilt, and be better than ever. Um, anytime you guys want to interject, you can feel free to. Don't wait, worry about me uh, uh, pausing or asking a question. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, definitely look forward to having the same things we have down here, but only better. You know, like you have a Tiffany's down here, you have a Tiffany's up there. So I could take my wife shopping at Tiffany's, but I don't have to buy anything because it's all paid for to begin with. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> oh, you're thinking Wait, of your wife, huh? How thoughtful you are thinking of your wife like that. Uh, you're not going to go buy some, something at Tiffany's for yourself, right? Well, I can't think of anything in Tiffany's that I want. You know, I, you know, there's a couple of things in a sporting goods store I'd like to be able to just go grab. So imagine well, you get me in the sporting world, you know, and then I say, oh, gee, I'd like to get this tank. Let me grab this, a couple fishing poles. You know, oh, here's a nice bow and arrow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, basically, whatever I want is, you know, basically I, I can come and buy without money. Yeah, and I've got some good news for you, brother, because uh, I plan on opening up uh, uh, Luke Boozer's uh, pub. And, well, you're being oh, no. competition with me. You're being competition gonna, with me. <laughs> I'm going to have, I'm going to have, I'm going to have green beer. And you can come over any time, and I won't even charge you anything for the green beer. Oh no, you're you're in competition with 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 with, 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 with brother Nick. <laughs> oh. it'll be a big universe, brother. Big you universe. know what it is though? It doesn't matter because there's no money to be made. It's all we don't need to worry about it. We can go to yours, or you can go to mine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he says the hymn quote. This is my father's world, unquote, expresses this truth in its final. Uh-oh, he was resurrected. Yes, he was. Oh, man. Look <laughs> at that. Go. Right back again. What's going on here? Let me make sure I don't have uh, the other thing on, to, you know, that, that uh, no, I don't have the uh, um Skype on, so I don't know why that's happening now. Okay, so there's two of me now, huh? Yes, there are. Let me get rid of that. Let me get rid of that alter ego. 
the alter ego. There I'm really are two of them. Do that. Yeah, alter ego of myself there, on uh, YouTube. Yeah, there's really two of it, two of me anyway, because I got the old man and the new man. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let me see. Um, I was reading this part. Uh, Just as God and mankind are reconciled in Christ, so too the dwelling of God and mankind, that's heaven and earth, uh, will be reconciled in Christ. As God and man will be forever united in Jesus, so heaven and earth will forever be united in the new physical universe where we will live as resurrected beings. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, this, you know, I think, I think there's an important point here. You know that we keep that we keep coming home to in this in this uniting heaven and earth and talking about God didn't have a plan B. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that you know we we tend to think of the level of importance that we have in God's eyes, and and that's true. We are very important, but all of His creation is important to Him. It's not just us. It's everything he made before us. It's all important to him. Like, um, you know, I'm, I'm a model builder. I like, I've always loved to build models, scale models of all kinds of things, aircraft, you know, cars, thing. and uh, I've been doing that since I was a kid. And I take great joy in the detail and the intricacy of the little details in, in the model to – and to put it together and then show that to other people. You know, have them look at it and say, look at the detail. Look at the – and – um. It's like I, I don't make those things to just discard them. I mean I make them because I take great joy in them, and I want other people to to take joy in them. So the idea of restoration is – of of the whole of creation, the universe, the earth, everything is all part of – in no way goes against anything. It, it's it's all part of, of God um, restoring what he loved to begin with. Remember everything he created before man ever came along, God said – God saw that it was good. You know, it was all good, and that says a lot when God uses that word. You know, that word "good." It saw that it was it was fantastic. It was great. It was it was, you know, f to God it was good. So this it it deserves to be preserved, and He wants it to be preserved. It's not just about us, though we are the biggest part of it. It's about the whole of creation. Mm, yeah, when you say we are the biggest part of it, uh, I, I was reading ahead in this book uh, earlier today. Uh, maybe 20 or 30 pages ahead, it really goes into that point that uh, how important man is in this whole scheme of the universe. And um, uh, I won't jump ahead in that really, but yeah, it really, the significance of man really blows me away how significant we are to God and in our place in the universe, our, our role in the universe. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot to be said about that, and we'll get m more into that later. Let's wel welcome Brother Austin to the... Hey, Austin. Hey, guys. How you doing? Yeah, we're fantastic, brother. How about you? Good, good. Okay. So, um, I guess you just pick up where we're going. We've only been talking for a few minutes anyway. So, uh, it says, uh, so the heaven and the earth are going to be united into an... And there'll be a new physical universe where we live as resurrected beings... To affirm anything less is to understate the redemptive work of Christ. Yet, strangely, in the schools and churches I've been a part of, and in the vast majority of the 150 books about heaven I've read, this central truth has rarely been affirmed. Many people with whom I've spoken have told of similar experiences. So, again, we've talked a lot about this in previous episodes, but there's just been so much either ignorance or neglect uh, on the whole idea that we're going to have a physical existence in a physical world and it'll be the new heavens and new earth. Uh, very, very few people are writing about it, talking about it from the pulpits. Uh, and as we're doing here, I, I think what we're doing is we're celebrating it. Uh, you know, we all have these days where we have problems and, and we get uh, discouraged, but you know, when we start thinking about our, our future, then this is something that we can look forward to, and it, it's a joyful hope. Uh, by the way, Austin, uh, you don't need to wait for me to uh, stop and ask questions. Anytime you want to interject something, feel free to, okay? Okay, we will do. And it says, Heaven is God's home. Earth is our home. Jesus Christ, as the God-man, forever links God and mankind, thereby forever links heaven and earth. 
As Ephesians 1.10 demonstrates, <clears throat> this idea of earth and heaven becoming one is explicitly biblical. Christ will make earth into heaven and heaven into earth. Just as the wall that separates God and mankind is torn down in Jesus, so too the wall that separates heaven and earth will be forever demolished. There will be one universe with all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, Jesus Christ. Quote, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. That's Revelation 21, verse 3. God will live us uh, with us on the new earth that will, quote, bring all things in heaven and on earth together, unquote. I think it's interesting there, the wording. And it just hit me, and we read it a few times now, but it just hit me, the wording there. Now the dwelling of God is with men. It doesn't say the converse. It doesn't say now the dwelling of men is with God. It says the dwelling of God is with men. So it's saying that heaven is going to come into what is the creation. The two are going to become one. It's not that we are going to go away from this, this creation of the physical universe and then it won't exist anymore. It says the opposite. It says that God's going to, going to – now the dwelling of God is going to be with man, and he will live with them. It puts it in such a way, and wording in Scripture, the way it's written originally, is put together in that way to show uh, a progression. It, it, it show, it's written that way to, to, to mean that. Mm -hmm. Hey, bro, Luke, did you say that he, uh, some in that, when you were reading, so he tore down something between us? Because I think that, I think something was remotely close to that. It reminded me of the verse, uh, Ephesians 2.14, that says, For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down that middle wall of partition between us. So, I mean, when when, he's, when you mentioned that Christ tore down that something dividing us, it reminded me of that verse. Yeah, you have salvation. The, this, this wall that separated man and God was sin. Christ removed that wall, that, that veil, that separation, uh, the barrier. He took away the sin of the world. So now there's no barrier between man and God, and we we can be reconciled through faith in Jesus. But now he's 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 comparing that to the fact that now there's also another barrier torn down, and that is uh, the uh, fellowship with God. He will actually live with us on the earth. Now, there I find it interesting the idea of uh, omnipresence, and then also locality. Uh, he, if he's going to live with us on the earth, but we know that God exists everywhere, uh, let's not confuse it with pantheism. God is not everything, but God is everywhere. Uh, so uh, somehow we know that God is omnipresent, and yet he's going to be like folk, the focal point of God and his, his existence is going to be right here on the earth with mankind. Austin uh, Austin picked a great verse. It's it's that's exactly what it's talking to. And you see another you know, another picture of this in when the veil of the temple is torn. Remember, the veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom, which is God signifying the end of the law condemning us as we know it, and that door of salvation opening to us, that doorway of a direct connection between Jesus uh, that Jesus gives us between us and God. And if you go further, um, I, I think it's important from where Austin spoke. I think we need to go a little further and read uh, the rest of that, the rest of the two verses after that. It says, "It says, for He is our peace, who hath made both one." and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So it's definitely talking, that what Austin said is true, that's exactly what it's talking about. Mm -hmm. It's opening that door for direct fellowship between us and God through Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. So you have a, a, a physical barrier, a, a, a spiritual barrier with sin. God's removed that. And, and then there's also a physical barrier, and that is that, that God is not in person living here with us on the earth, but he will come to earth after he recreates us and the, and, and the earth, and we, he will come and live here with us. There will be no barrier, physical barrier, separating uh, our God, our God Almighty, Jesus Christ, the God-man, will be with us on the earth. Absolutely. That does also ring a bell to that. Uh, this verse is also 
I believe, taken way out of context for the kind of like the lordship crowd, but reminds me of that the new man. Well, it says in Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Isn't that just referencing that Christ is dwelling within that person, become that new creature? Well, well, I think Austin, it's important to go back to that verse. It's funny that they take, you know, it's interesting that they do this often because they take they take a verse that is meant to say exactly the opposite thing. And they take it because they take the one last part of that verse and say, for to make in himself of twain one new man. But look at the beginning of that other of that verse, verse 15. Having abolished, what does abolish mean? Thrown right. away, gotten rid of, in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So it, it says that right before that. So it's saying he's made the law of no conviction to the believer. He's it, it does not it cannot convict us anymore. It, it, that it says it right there. For so for them to take just that next clipping of the verse and say for to make in himself of twain one new man. Well, yes, we are a new man. We are a new man. That doesn't mean that we're never going to do anything wrong again. It means it means in spiritually we've been perfected in our spirit. Yet in the flesh, we, we still unfortunately dwell in this 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 shell, this sinful you know this sinful body that unfortunately we're still part of the creation that that is in sin. So so yes, it does make a new man because as far as and the way you got to look at that is because as far as God's concerned, we're already dead. We were up on the the minute we claim Christ. We were up on the cross with him. We were beaten with him. We died with him. We as soon as we claimed that, we w went through all that with him. We claim all that. Okay, he did that for us and took us with him. So God, when he sees us now, he doesn't see that anymore he, because Christ completely washes that away. It's funny because you say that, and I just walked back in the room because i got to get some dinner. But, um, you know, my last three videos or last few videos, I've been dealing with a, a, a sinless perfectionist. Right. You, you did uh, the First John series. Yeah, yeah I did First yep. John. Yeah. 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 That was a much-needed uh, teaching on First John. Uh, I, I agree with you completely on that, John. Anybody who's watching this video, you, you should watch Mitch's uh, video on First John because I think that uh, um, people, there's a lot of people that they, they want to uh, think of First John as a, as a obligation that they, I mean, I know some people that they say they, they are using First John continually over and over day, all day long. Every time they, anything comes into their head they think is bad, they go to First John, and they don't realize that the First John confess our sin doesn't mean every time we think we've sinned we've got to go confess it. It means that before we get saved we just need to acknowledge we're a sinner that needs the Savior. Once we've done that, then we've confessed all of our sin uh, that we're a sinner. Period, and, and no more. There's no more need for continuing confession, whether it's to a Roman Catholic priest or whether it's in your privacy in your own room, uh, house uh, to between you and God. You don't have to confess it anymore. All the sins have been paid for. We just need to acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. Jesus is the Savior. You know, I could take that a step further with from the Old Testament. You realize that the Old Testament, they had to, to, to sacrifice blood, the blood of bulls and rams in the Old Testament. Well, they had a sacrifice that they had to sacrifice for sins that they didn't even know that they committed. So if you have to sacrifice for sins that, that you don't even know you committed, how are you possibly going to be able in this age be able to confess every sin that you don't even know what all your sins are? It would right. be impossible. Yeah. Like Jack yeah. Max says, we sin an act, word, or deed throughout the entire day and not even know most of what all they are. Well, I'm going to grab some dinner. I'll be right back. Okay. Yep. All right. All right. Uh, so he said, God's plan is that there will be no more gulf between the spiritual and physical worlds. There will be no divided loyalties or divided realms. There will be one cosmos, one universe united under one Lord forever. This is the unstoppable plan of God. This is where history is headed. When God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, earth was heaven's backyard. The new earth will be even more than that. It will be heaven itself. And those who know Jesus will have the privilege of living there. Now, I... Uh, I subscribe to a publication, a free publication uh, called uh, Grace in Focus. 
and it's uh, put published by an organization called Grace Evangelical Society. And I don't know if it's a coincidence, but uh, in the in the this month's publication, they do a a review of this book that we're going through, this Randy Alcorn's book uh, on heaven, a, a, a review, a critique of it, and uh, they they basically uh, have uh, two complaints and, and one acknowledgement of uh, you know worth that it's worthwhile. Uh, one is that they question whether uh, his presentation of uh, salvation is is uh, uh, tainted, and uh, I agree that uh, he presents salvation, but then he adds surrendering your life and and uh, uh, you know repenting of your sins. So he he spoils it. He has the real message of salvation, and then he spoils it by adding those things. And we covered that in the very beginning. The one or two video one or two when we talked about how do you get to heaven, so we we explained it the correct way. So their their criticism of Randy Alcorn in that respect is valid, uh, but the uh, the other criticism they have is that they he says they say that he he um, blurs this difference between heaven we what we what he calls in his book and we've been referring to as the intermediate heaven he they he blurs that and, and it makes the new heaven the new earth he calls uh, referring to that as heaven they think is a mistake because they think they should keep the distinction that heaven is the, this place people are right now but in eternity people are not going to be in heaven they're just going to be on the new earth but uh, i do you think it's a mistake to refer to the new, the new heaven, new earth, our eternal uh, home on the on the resurrected earth, the, re, the uh, restored earth, is referring to that as heaven. Do you think that's a mistake, as as GES uh, believes it is? Uh, absolutely. I uh, if I if you wouldn't mind, let me just say one thing. Um, yeah, I'd say absolutely not. And Revelation twenty one three right there in the book confirms this. Okay, let me ask you this question. It's just, it's a very simple process. Where does God dwell? Where uh, does God dwell? God right is now. omnipresent, so He is everywhere. But but His dwelling is where? He had His throne is in in heaven. Right, uh, correct. And it, it, there is a location for it. There is an actual throne of location right. where we don't know exactly where it is. Right. Now that's that's his dwelling. He dwells there. Now Revelation twenty one three says, "Now the dwelling of God is with men." If where God is is heaven, and His dwelling is with men, and the creation and heaven are one place, then it is heaven by default because God dwells there. It's very simple. This is not complicated, and I don't I don't see where there's a complication in that yeah. idea. Uh, I don't have an issue with the way Randy uh, is d uh, explaining that, and, and as you just stated, I agree with that. Uh, I was a little surprised by them thinking, finding some fault in that. Their their, their real conclusion about the book was that uh, it's not for the new, uh, the uneducated Christian, the, the, because they could be get some misunderstandings, particularly about salvation. Uh, they, but they, for someone who is uh, has a strong core belief in the essentials for salvation, and then and they have knowledge, a lot of knowledge of scriptures. Then they could go through this as we are and benefit from this book. I, I'd say I agree with that statement. I'd say that's accurate. I, I, I'd say it's a you know you, you, as a Christian you you're when you're first new Christian you're on the milk as Paul says you're on milk and you desire he desires for us to be on meat and God desires for us eventually to be on meat. So there are milk things you you handle as a as a first believer as an early believer and then there's the meat issues you handle later yeah. and there are certain things that are a little more advanced that maybe beginning Christians should be. You know, more, more, um, more dealing with you know themselves. You know, their relationship with God, their their fellowship with Him. Um, you know, th that should be their main focus, their understanding of salvation, the the, the simpler things at first. And maybe this is a little more advanced. Um, yeah, uh, I, would, I agree with that. I'd say I agree with that. I think I could kind of flip it around on GES. Uh, first, saying that uh, personally, I have recommended and endorsed GES wholeheartedly for the last couple of years in numerous of my videos I have a playlist just called I think it's Bob Wilkin or GES Grace Evangelical Society uh, I recommend them I find very little fault in them however I could have to say the same caveat about GES or any organization I've ever ever studied and, and that is that uh, 
uh, there's a, a great uh, benefits in, in being associated with them, learning from them, uh, mm -hmm. hearing them out, and sure. yet I still find some fault in their teaching because sure. I, I find some areas where uh, I'm not in complete agreement. <laughs> Uh, I won't go into the particular right now, but there, it's not it's not the most important thing. But hey, you're you're not going to find any author, uh, any organization, any person. You're going to be in a hundred brothers, brother or sister in Christ. <laughs> that you're going to be able to say, hey, uh, let's talk for a, a hundred hours about theology, and you're going to find that right. you don't have one disagreement no. in a hundred hours of talking. So, I've, I've never experienced that myself. I, I, I mean, me personally, I've never experienced. Now, Austin, what was your take? You started to say something. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. That's fine. Thank you. I was just curious. I thought that he was a free gracer. Alcorn, sure. Randy Alcorn. Uh, well... I think there are spots where he kind of – I think they have a legitimate argument. There are spots where it seems that he is – he does a, a, a very good description of free grace, and then he seems to add some things to it. And he seems to like, – like Luke was saying, he seems to add – you know, uh, t turning away from your sins, and and it, se it seems to imply that that's now now again, I and mean, this is a clarification issue. Should Christians who are saved try to turn from their sins? Absolutely, not because your salvation rests upon it, but because as a as an obedient son of God or obedient daughter of God, you should try to turn away from the things that don't please God. It's just it's just a natural process of what you should do as a as a uh, obedient child, but you're already saved. It's it's not a condition of your of your salvation. It's it's a condition of fellowship. It's a condition of of uh, of your you know what we refer to as your walk, your 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 fellowship with God. Yeah. Okay. When uh, on probably I think it was probably part two or maybe part three when we were discussing this and going through his book, uh, I purposely edited out some of his uh, statements that were uh, erroneous in this that regard. Uh, but since GES brought it up as a complaint against him, I thought maybe we should uh, discuss it now. And, so, and that is that he talks about cross and the payment of our sins and, and believing in Jesus, trusting Jesus. And, and, and he'll say, let's say he says has a hundred statements about that that are correct. And then he'll have maybe three statements that he puts in there, inserts in there that I think some of these people do it almost as they feel maybe obligated that, oh, I don't want to forget that, even though it's not a requirement for salvation. I got I don't want people to think that uh, there's no longer any uh, question about uh, sinning. You know, so they, they feel maybe it's peer pressure too because the vast majority of pastors and authors are going to uh, include that. So sometimes they feel the pressure to add it even though – you know, you know, Luke. I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I thought about this the other day, and I'm glad you said it. You reminded me, and thank you, Lord, for reminding me to say this. I, it, it speaks it, to me. There's another factor there. It speaks volumes about whether people doubt the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's almost as if they say, if I don't put this stipulation to you. I can't trust that you're going to do these things. I, I can't trust that you're going to be better or grow or or kind of grow, grow yourself out of some of these sins. And in, in me, to me, that's almost doubting the power of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit can eventually change that person and through time mold that person and change that person in their heart, and they'll, they'll begin to overcome some of the things that they have issues with, which is what you become saved, and then that's the process that happens. That doesn't happen first. You don't stop sinning, get saved, and... And then everything's great. I mean, you, you, the, the, you know, your, your, your life of stopping some of the sins that you fall to has to do with your growth in, with the Holy Spirit through your, through your spiritual life, you know, through your life with, uh, with Christ. So, that, that's a natural progress after the fact. So, it, 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 I wonder, you know, is that so much like if I don't tell you to do this, you'll never do it? I mean, because and to me, that in a way, you're saying you doubt the power of the Holy Spirit to change that person's life eventually. Yeah, I, I, let me say that I, I've uh, said this many times while I was actually preaching, uh, and also uh, in some videos I've made this same point too, <laughs> in that people act like well, are, you're negligent if you don't talk about that. And I say, no, no, what I'm doing is I want to tell them how to get saved. I don't want to confuse the issue and make them think that there's other, th other requirements that, that have nothing to do with getting saved. So I'm going to tell them exactly what they need to do to get saved. I'm going to trust Jesus to save them. And then once they're saved, I'm going to, I don't have to hold their hand and try to make them grow and mature. I'm going to turn, they're turned over to the Holy Spirit now. I trust Jesus to save them. I trust the Holy Spirit to transform them. 
And, exactly. and, and some people are, are going to uh, embrace the Holy Spirit, some people are going to fight the Holy Spirit, and some exactly. people are going to... Some, some people, people are going to be completely confused about the whole, what the Holy Spirit does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and they're so, going to tell you that the Holy Spirit points out your sins. Mm -hmm. Points them out. Oh, you got a sin there. Clean it up. Oh, yeah. oh, you got a sin over here. Clean it up. It's, it's, not, it's not that the Holy Spirit points out your sin. It's that the Holy Spirit molds your heart to move away from those things. He, Absolutely, he, but these he, people are lost. These, these people are, are looking at the Holy Spirit as some sort of, uh, of, 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 you know, oh, now here you do the work. Yeah, it's it, there's a difference between – it's like the difference between punishing somebody and um, – and uh, and and um, reprimanding them, you know, it's like th there's a there's a if you're reprimanding for a purpose, you know, or just punishing because you enjoy the delivering of the punishment, you know, they, they make the they make the Holy Spirit someone who is the happy deliverer of the bad news to them. It's not that; it's that the Holy Spirit is challenging your heart and convicting your heart to to want to move away from those things. It's not that he's putting a guilt trip on you for feeling it; it's that he's making you realize, hey, this is something that's affecting your fellowship. This is something you should be growing yeah. from, and over time he molds you out of this. Right, but you know what? Facial hair is against the Holy Spirit, so we should all shave. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me too, Brother Jackson mentioned this last night. He said the parable of the sower, and you know, most people always think that everybody has to be a four, and that four was the guy who bears much fruit and does everything else, but I, we came to the conclusion that two and three is also saved, and two was the one that, uh, when uh, persecution comes, they turn away. And three was the one that's caught up with worldly affairs. But I mean, not every Christian is going to have the same maturity. You might have a, you might have a four and a couple twos, but all are yeah. saved. That's the, that's the well, bottom that, that's line. That's exactly right, Austin. It's a great point, and that's what Paul was dealing with when he came to carnal Christians. When he dealt with the carnal Christians, I believe it was in Corinth, when he went to them and spoke to them, he told them, he said, he knew they were carnal. He regarded them as brothers and sisters. He still regarded them as his brothers and sisters. He was just warning them to, not, to, to stop being carnal. He tells them, I came to you. I wanted to give you meat, but you're not ready for meat. I have to, I have to keep you in milk because you're not growing. You're not, allowed, you're, you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. You're not listening to the calling. Of the Holy Spirit to move in that walk, that other direction. You're not, you're not heeding his. It's like the Holy Spirit is, you know, you you have uh, two paths you can begin to kind of wander on through your life. You you can listen to the old man and kind of wander on the path where you still continue in your sin, and there's the other path where the Holy Spirit's kind of calling you through the, you know, through the through the darkness, saying, "Come this way, this way, this way. I want you to go this way." And you can fight that because the other path looks really good and enticing, and you really want to continue walking that way. But it's going to lead to trouble in your life. It's going to lead to problems. It's going to lead to further, you know, being steeped in your sin. So it, there is that, like Mitch kind of put it, like you want to fight him. You want to. You can either listen to him and listen to the calling, or you can fight it. You know? Right. I think that uh, uh, there's a, a group of Christians that do not understand the, um, the uniqueness and individualities uh, of, of each person's uh, uh, transformation, their birth. For, if, if, we, if there are 10 people born here in the hospital in Las Vegas today, uh, and we track their lives over the next, you know, 30, 40 years. You're going to see that some of these people are going to take their lives really seriously and uh, study hard and pursue careers and, and, and try to, uh, and, and they'll achieve a lot very quickly. Other people don't take it as seriously and they don't, they don't ever achieve near as much. And some mm -hmm. people become abject failures. And that's because they're individuals. We're not all like identical growth as human beings. The same thing is when we're born, if you have 10 people born again spiritually today, 10 people today put their faith in Jesus. The next 40 years, you're going to find that some of these people are going to listen to that, the Holy Spirit's promptings, and they're going to embrace the Holy Spirit and want to grow and mature. And other people are going to like stifle it, quench it, uh, mm. and, and they're, they're going to resist it, and they're, they're not going to maybe ever become the spiritual uh, mature Christians that they could have been. And so just as we're, not, we're all unique individuals non-spiritually, we're also unique individuals spiritually too. Not everybody achieves the same level of maturity spiritually, and some do it quickly, some do it slowly. Some don't do it at all. 
Some people are completely bankrupt spiritually, even though they're a child of God. Now, I'm just wondering how much I've grown because I have this tendency to go, la, 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 I'm just wondering if they, I can do that in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we got off sidetrack there, but I think that was an Have I grown in the Spirit? Important thing to understand. Uh, yeah. Wait, oh, now I get it. I didn't get it for a second. That was speaking in tongues, wasn't it? <laughs> All right. Oh, no. I keep for that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, who will reign over the earth? Is the question. The Bible's central storyline revolves around a question. Who will reign over the earth? Earth's destiny hangs in the balance. Because it is the realm where God's glory has been most challenged and resisted, it is therefore also the stage on which his glory will be most graphically demonstrated. By reclaiming, restoring, renewing, and resurrecting earth, and empowering a regenerated mankind to reign over it, God will accomplish his purpose of bringing glory to himself. Uh, you know, I've um, if 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 each of us was asked, explain the Bible in one sentence. We probably would have a different way of explaining it. Let's just take a stab at that, just for a moment here. Okay, in one sentence, explain the Bible. Uh, who wants to go first? I do. Okay, go ahead. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Okay, uh, Eric. That's tough, actually. <laughs> I don't know if I can put it into one sentence. Um, that, you're gonna have to do it. I used to uh, this, had this young street preacher that he was out there trying to tell people all this theology of the Bible. I said, "Wait a second. Are you an evangelist? Just tell them how to get saved." And I made him be able to do it in like in in uh, thirty seconds. God saves. That's it. Yeah. Um, and, and, so now I'm asking you to condense the Bible into one sentence. <laughs> That's really hard. That actually is really hard. It's kind. Of, it's kind of difficult. It covers such such a huge spectrum of things. It, um, I always referred to it as uh, like your VCR that nobody likes to touch and nobody ever figures out how to work their VCR. Remember that was always a big joke. It's God's yeah. instruction manual. So it's it's if. If you follow the instruction manual, you'll probably be able to operate the thing, but if you don't, you're not going to be able to operate it. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about uh, Austin? Can you uh, explain the Bible in one sentence? Uh, God's, God loves you, and t God loves you, so to go back home, believe upon Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. Now, that's a great um, statement. But I'm not sure it explains the Bible in a sentence, uh, and I'm not sure you're going to agree with my answer either. But um, I'll tell you what someone said uh, that I've studied a lot. Dr. Peter Ruckman. I've got about 40 of his books, many of his Bible commentaries. Even though he's KJV only, and he has some other viewpoints that I don't agree with, uh, I think he's a a, a great uh, theologian uh, and brilliant man. And yet he says the Bible is the uh, struggle for a kingdom. Who's going to be king of the earth? Uh, and uh, uh, that's one way of explaining it. Uh, the way that another writer said it, uh, he said it's paradise lost and paradise regained. And to well, me, I think those that conjunctions should 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 be uh, not should be in there because because it's actually two sentences. But go ahead. Paradise lost and paradise regained. Yeah, because you use the conjunction. Well, it's still one sentence. Uh, you're right, it is, technically. Okay. Uh, but my point is that, that that's really what this, the whole Bible is the story of, how man lost paradise and man will regain paradise. Okay? Uh, so uh, now I, I think I lost my place where I was in the book. Uh-oh. What page was I on, Eric? I think you were on um, 104. You were on 104... Um, yes, you because you did the uh, you were on 104 the very the very first full paragraph. Mm -hmm. Your last line was God will accomplish His purpose of bringing glory to Himself. 104 at the oh, time. No. no, I was I'm on 101. It says who will reign over the earth. 
That's why I asked this question. It says, the Bible, this is Randy Alcorn's statement on what the Bible is. He says, the Bible's central storyline revolves around a question. Who will reign over the earth? And that's what Dr. Ruckman, how he sees it too. Who's going to reign over the earth? It's a, it's, it's a struggle for a kingdom. And uh, Earth's destiny hangs in the balance. Uh, so that's, to me, uh, who's going to rule over the earth? Well, God ruled the earth. He gave it to man. Man gave it to Satan. Satan's been ruling it. We've had men having various kinds of kingdoms and, and empires all throughout history. But really, God is not ruling over the earth until Jesus sets up his kingdom and then finally uh, we'll have the right king. And, you know, uh, I, I kind of agree with that, but I kind of really think that maybe the, the major theme of the Bible are, are, are who are the sons of God revealed. What's that? Who are the sons of God revealed? No, in, other word, in other words, um, the journey to heaven through... The kingdom is, it's all about, it is definitely about two kingdoms, and it's definitely about the reign of a kingdom. But, but, but it's more about the glory of Jesus Christ and his children, his church. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it, really, is it really a struggle to know who's going to rule over the, the earth, or is it just the devil's struggle? Because I don't, I don't really see God struggling to rule over the earth. Well, um, there are people who are what are called uh, uh, amillennial and, and uh, postmillennial. Postmillennial means they believe, like a Roman Catholic Church believes, they're postmillennial. They believe the millennium is going on right now, right? And that and that uh, this is the kingdom uh, mm -hmm. already, and Christ is the king, and his representative is the vicar of Christ, the Pope, right? And and this is the kingdom. So, uh, but to me, uh, this is if this is the the millennial kingdom. Uh, it's certainly not very very pleasant picture of of, of, the, of a wonderful uh, millennium, is it? It's not the way I see the millennium described in scriptures. Uh, no, not at all. I had no idea that Catholics believe that. I don't, I, is that just a certain sect of Catholicism, or is that all major Catholicism? No, that's 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 Catholicism, and they're not the only ones there. See, you are you have the 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 tribulation. I mean, you have the rapture, and you have the millennium, and you have pre and you have different viewpoints about these. Uh, you have pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, post-tribulation post rapture, and then you all have millennium. You have a millennium, which means there's not going to be any millennium. It's just like a, some kind of a, a weird idea that uh, doesn't really isn't a reality. And then you have post-millennial. They believe that the millennium is happening now, uh, and, and uh, the the church is in, is Jesus is on the throne right now, but. Uh, on the earth, or through 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 the Pope, right. uh, and then you have uh, premillennial. Uh, that means that Jesus will return uh, and then set up the millennium, and he'll be the king on the earth. See, that's uh, the thing with Catholicism. I when I was used to do catechism, we got a they gave us like a Catholic ordained book that we read out of and everything. But even still, I can't remember any of the teachings Catholicism had besides. Uh, like the first communion and confirmation, thing. I I was never taught their views on certain things. I, I I remember we only had one class one time on purgatory, even. So I mean, it was confusing being a Catholic because I think most Catholics don't even understand what they what the church actually believes. Yeah, in. I agree with you, Austin. I grew up with that myself, and I agree with you. Um, I as a child, it was a very confusing thing because and and the way it's delivered is meant to be that way you you don't really there aren't really very many questions answered it's mostly you you'd have to find them out for yourself or delve a little deeper to get any kind of answers for things like that because it's basically just repetitively you dealing with the same things over and over and over again at mass and you're 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 kind of, you, you just hear the same things and what's prepared for you and that's all you, you're never i was never once uh, ever uh, uh, told or or um, inspired by anyone in the Catholic Church to go read my Bible, never, right. because that was that was something I'm not supposed to really try to understand myself. I'm supposed to just go at the pre-prepared mass booklets that you go there and you read what's been prepared for you. It's usually just the same thing over and over and over again, except what the priest decides he's going to make his his uh, speech about, you know, for the day, his sermon about for the day. Um, but that's 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 it. There are no real, there's no real attempt to answer the deeper questions unless you delve into those things yourself. Well, I missed all of those things because we usually left early and got jelly donuts. 
you know, we were the ones who were like by the back door before before the church like let out, and then we got out the back door before just before the church let out. So we didn't listen to that. We're like, hey, come on, get out of here. We gotta get to the bakery. We pick up some jelly donuts and go home. So we're like, we we got the up down up down kneel pray this that the other end. Let's get out of here. That was it. <laughs> right. Okay, I'm on, I'm on page 102, and he says, In Scripture, those said to have thrones include God the Father, that's in Hebrews 12.2, and Revelation 22.1. Christ the Son, he has a throne, that's in Luke 1.32 and Hebrews 1.8. It says, God's human children, that's in Revelation 4.4 4 and 11.16. And Satan has a throne. And that's in Revelation 2.13. Could you look that up, Eric? Revelation 2.13, that's, that's one I'm not familiar with. Sure. Uh, he says, God's claim to his throne is absolute. The claim of human beings to their thrones is valid, but only if they remain in submission to God, who delegated dominion to them as his heirs and sub-rulers. Satan's claim to the throne is false. That's what Randy Elkhorn says. So what does that verse say, Eric? Um, it's um, this is one of the, I believe one of the letters to the churches, and it says, "I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth." So where Satan's seat is, yes, I think that's where he's referring to it as his throne, I guess. Yes. Um, did, do we have another translation that actually says throne there in Revelation 2.13? I think you might find a different translation where it says Satan's throne, I'm guessing. Um. Okay, he says, ultimately Satan will be eternally dethroned. People who reject God will be eternally dethroned. God will be permanently enthroned. Righteous human beings first enthroned by God to reign over the earth from Eden, then dethroned by their own sin and Satan, will be re-enthroned forever with God, and they will reign forever and ever, Revelation 22.5. Could you get find a Revelation 22.5? Sure. So he's recounting this struggle for this kingdom, this throne, and he's saying that, okay, well, I'll read this again. Uh, People who, re, uh, go, uh, Satan will be eternally dethroned. People who reject God will be eternally dethroned. God will be permanently enthroned. Righteous human beings first enthroned by God to reign over the earth from Eden. So in other words, God gave Adam and Eve the, 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 the crown, the throne. Uh, then dethroned, they were dethroned because of their sin and Satan. He says, they will be re-enthroned again, but forever with God. And then, then the verse he cited, Eric? Uh, the verse 22.5, Revelation 22.5 says, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That's what Revelation 22.5 says. Yeah. Uh, now in context, is that referring to uh, uh, mankind? Let me see. Let me check the overall. Take a step back there. 22.5. Yes, because he, say, he says if you start off in verse, like for instance, verse 3, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Um, and then it read the verse that I just said, and they shall reign forever and ever. Okay, so I think this is making the point that... Uh, in eternity, uh, man will rule with God over the, his creation. Okay? So this, you can see that this is the, uh, the whole story of, of, of the hi history of mankind, and that is this, who, who's going to rule? God, God gave Adam and Eve this power to rule, and then they lost it because of sin and Satan's uh, involvement and tempting them away. And it's been a struggle all these this, throughout history for who's going to rule. But we know in the end, God will rule and man will rule with God uh, if for, through uh, eternity. Christ will become the unchallenged absolute ruler of the universe and then will turn over to his father, the kingdom he has won, uh, could you look up 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 28? 
Redeemed humans will be God's unchallenged, delegated rulers of the new earth. God and humanity will live together in eternal happiness forever, deepening their relationships as the glory of God permeates every aspect of the new creation. And 1 Corinthians 15.28 says, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Okay. So, uh, I guess he's going to be delegating. It says we're go he, he will delegate us as rulers. Mitch, how many cities are you going to rule over anyway? I don't want to rule anything. Okay. I'll let somebody else do I'll give that to my wife to do. She's <laughs> fishing and having a good time. Uh, you know, somebody said you want to be a pillar. I'm like, why would I want to be a pillar and stand there like this? <laughs> you know, no, actually. No, I would, I, you know what, I, I don't know what it would be like to be a ruler of, uh, of, of a city, uh, but uh, I guess it would be kind of cool. Um me, I just want to kind of like hike the hills. Like I want to see the new China, you know. But, but honestly, no. I, I think I, I I would like to have some sort of authority, but not over men, but just over how things are run. Maybe I I don't know. Yeah. But, but well, it'll be part time. Yeah. I I I think that maybe those people who are really ambitious and want to rule over a lot of cities might be disappointed because maybe they're at that and kind of ambition will be kind of like wood, hay, and stubble. And someone like Mitch, maybe that he, he, he's not looking for power and authority and, and ruling. Maybe God will say that, that's the kind of man I want to help me. With. Oh, boy, that really helps me out a lot. Really, you know? <laughs> I got I got to say, I'm kind of in the same boat a little bit because, I mean, to me, that's a very – when you say something like that, I mean, that's a very humbling thought. It's a very – to, to, to think, to contemplate that when that scale serving as a little king under the great king, you know, um, it's a very humbling thought to have that kind of authority and power, that, that responsibility. It's, it's, it's not something I don't know if I'd even want to think about. I don't know. I, don't know. I, could, I, I could not see myself doing something like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's given us examples about, uh, you know, um, our, at the judgment seat, the be, the Bema seat, where we get judged for our, our rewards, and mm -hmm. uh, he's also said, uh, "Build up your treasures in heaven," and he also talked about uh, giving us giving you something and trying to build something with it. And if you do well, you'll be able to rule over ten cities, and someone else will rule over five, and someone else gets to rule over one city. So I, I think God is not uh, against uh, the idea of us. Um, building up these treasures and maybe building up our position. Mm -hmm. uh, and not everybody is going to be equal. I, I can imagine the Apostle Paul uh, having a, a, a much larger share than Brother Luke, you know, for, sure. for everything. Or, 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 even, or even any of those who came before us who were martyred, who gave their lives, their physical lives, you know, yeah. for, for their faith. I mean... And you, you, you look at those people and say, I tend to tell people, I say, look, you know, I've just accepted the fact I'm not exactly going to be at the front of the line. <laughs> I'm just, yeah. I don't think I'm going to be at the front of the line, okay? I know myself, and maybe God sees me in a different way, but, you know, but I, I know myself, and I don't think I'm going to be at the front of the line, maybe the middle of the line. But I think the other thing that you mentioned is it speaks a lot to that is the verse that says, you know, many who desire to be first will be last, and the last will be first. You know, it speaks volumes about what you were saying about those people who think they're going to get these tremendous seats of power are going to find that maybe they're not going to get these tremendous seats of power. It's going to go to somebody with a little more humility and a little more, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we're going to speculate more in the future about uh, you know uh, the, the whole universe. But I'm I'm thinking maybe we're going to be have uh, not just cities on Earth, but but uh, sectors of the universe too. Sure, absolutely. Okay, he said another point is the second Adam defeats Satan. Satan successfully tempted the first Adam in, in Eden. The theological consequences of Adam's sin and the redeeming work of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, the new head of the human race, are laid out in Romans 5, verses 12 through 19. Could you look that up, Eric? Sure. Uh, when, when Satan tempted the second Adam in the wilderness, which is what Eden's garden had become, Christ resisted him, but the evil one was 
desperate to defeat Christ, to kill him as he had the first Adam. That's in Matthew and Luke. Um, you got that? Yep. Uh, Romans Real 5, 12 through 19 uh, states, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got, the Bible calls it the first Adam and the second Adam. Jesus Christ is referred to as the second Adam. Uh, through, through the first Adam, we all inherited death, condemnation. And through the second Adam, Jesus Christ, we all res will ha receive eternal life, those of us who put our faith in Jesus. That, that's uh, a good statement. Um, I just wanted to, to, to kind of put that also, the context of it was that in the beginning of Romans, not that I, I want to digress too much, is that Paul was talking about the fact that all have sinned, Jew or Gentile. And this is why death reigned from Adam to Moses. This is what he said. That, that, that death was still still out there bef before the, the law came to Moses, basically saying that we all have sinned and also saying that we all have one righteous Savior. So, you know, that's kind of, you know, uh, putting, I'd like to put that into context because a lot of people don't see that what Paul's point was there was that, that we're all put under Christ, but also that Jew, the Jew and Gentile alike come to Christ through the blood because we're the, no no one is righteous no not one mm -hmm. yeah and while you're on that I would add that the uh, um, that's another way of uh, understanding that uh, the method and message of salvation is the same for Jews and Gentiles today absolutely there is no different way of getting saved for Jews it's absolutely. the same way Absolutely, and I think, and, and to build on what Mitch said, I think he's, I think he's absolutely correct. What, what he's, what he's doing here through Romans is he's uniting all of mankind again under the umbrella of being children of Adam. I mean, we're all ultimately Adam's children. So, um, and by Adam sin entered, which means that applies to all of us. And he's saying by Jesus, all that's all Jew, Gentile, everyone, uh, everyone comes to Christ to be made righteous. Mm -hmm says, uh, Satan appeared to succeed when the second Adam died. When, that was Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. But Jesus didn't die uh, because he had sinned. He died because as God's son, he chose to pay the price for mankind's sin, tracing all the way back to the first Adam and forward to the final generation of the fallen earth. Satan's apparent victory in Christ's death was what assured the devil's final defeat. When Christ rose from the dead, he dealt Satan a fatal blow, crushing his head, assuring both his destruction and the resurrection of mankind and the earth. Satan's grip on this world was loosened. It's still strong, but once he is cast into the lake of fire and God refashions the old earth into the new earth, mankind and earth will slip forever from Satan's grasp, never again to be touched by him. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'm moving on to the, the next point is removing the curse. Uh, quote, no longer will there be any curse. That's Revelation 22.3. 
if the Bible said nothing about else about life in the eternal heaven, the new earth, these words would tell us a vast amount. No more curse. What would our lives be like if the curse were lifted? One day we will know firsthand, but even now there's much to anticipate. He's going to talk about how removing the curse, uh, how this is, uh, affects uh, us and the, all of creation. Uh, but let's get your reaction to this first. Uh, no more curse. Wow. What's your thought on that as far as the ramifications of no more curse? What is the curse? What happened in the curse? Well, in the beginning of the curse, women were going to have, of course, more travail or more pain in childbirth. But men, and this is, you know, especially for me, you know, he was working the ground. All of a sudden, thorns are coming up. You know, off the, by the sweat of his brow, he's going to he's going to make his living, mm -hmm. and um, so so um, so the curse and and death came, and strife came, and hatred came, and all sorts of things came by the striving of men uh, uh, and people to become exalted over one another. I tell you what, another part of the curse was people didn't think about too is man became a. Uh, a, a being that was constantly looking over his shoulder because neither did – it wasn't just uh, dying old age he had to worry about. It was it was weather that could kill him or natural – any kind of natural disasters, animals that might be trying to kill him. It might be – he became it became a being that was constantly looking over his shoulder. He didn't have that before. And constantly running to make a check. Exactly. Constantly trying to trying to trying to get by, you know, trying yeah. trying, to, yeah. trying to and then dog eat dog, one man over another man, yeah. dealing dealing with, with with not only that but all sorts of jealousy and anger mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. sorts of, of of people exalting themselves over people. I mean, the curse caused a major wreck yeah. on this earth. Yep. Mm -hmm. it sure it's ev it's everything. It's everything that made Earth no longer paradise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know, uh, again, getting back to the idea that uh, you know we we have our days of troubles and just being discouraged. But what I always like to do is put things in perspective and count my blessings. And uh, I've got sometimes I've actually got a pen out and start writing down all my blessings. And you know, if you really think about it, I mean, you can go on page after page after page if you think about in all the ways we're blessed. But when we talk about this curse and what happened with man is much of the history of man the vast majority of mankind throughout history every single day was just a struggle to try to stay alive from the elements from starvation from uh, you know, uh, warfare uh, you, you know every day your life was in danger could you live even another day it was not easy so we take a lot for granted being in this time and history and particularly at this location in the, in the world with with uh, you know so much uh, prosperity and abundance in America. You know, it's strange that you mention that because I think that might help me out. I never saw the wisdom in this guy, but I kind of starting to like Zig Ziglar. Yeah, Zig Ziglar is very good. He wrote uh, uh, the um, uh, he wrote a lot of motivational books, gave a lot of motivational speeches, and he, he he's a Christian that has a everything he's he wrote was was based upon Christian uh, principles in the Bible. Zig Ziglar, another one who's very like, much like him, and actually was, I think they were friends, it was a guy named Og Mandino. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking Mandino, about. Yeah. He wrote the, uh, wrote the greatest uh, salesman in the world, which was really, uh, when you find out about it, it was about a guy named Saul of Tarsus. I read it. <laughs> the greatest salesman in the world. He, yeah. wrote, he also wrote the greatest miracle in the world. And uh, Og Mandino was, uh, and he also wrote... Um, I think a book called The Christ Commission. The Christ Commission is a pretty large novel, and it's one of my favorite books I've ever read. And the premise, I know I'm diverging now, but this book is so good that I, I, I want to recommend it to you. It's a story about this guy who's a fictional writer. And he's going to receive a, uh, he's got a new bestseller coming out, and he's being interviewed on the Johnny Carson show. Uh, and, and Johnny Carson's asking about his book, and he said, uh, 
uh, you know, you've written bestseller after bestseller after bestseller. Have you, you know, written so many books? You're a prolific writer. Have you, have you ever write a book and start writing a book and you kind of get stumped? And he, he said, oh, it's interesting you asked that. Yeah, because I wrote a start. I've been writing a book for years and I, I just, I, I haven't been able to finish it. And he said, Johnny Carter said, well, what's it about? And he said, well, it's a man that goes back uh, able to. Uh, Go to the it's like the the Warren Commission investigated the assassination of, of John Kennedy. This would be called the Christ Commission, and it's a commission of people who are who are going back to investigating the death and resurrection of Jesus to see if it was real or not. And Johnny Carr says, "Wow, that's really fascinating." He he said he said, well, "Why don't you finish that book?" And he says, "Well, I I really." After all my years of research, I I just concluded that uh, you know it was just a, a, a fake or a fraud. It never really happened. And silence in the audience, and everybody got and the audience and Johnny Carson were like stunned by it, and they, they had to rush him off the stage because people in the audience were getting so angry. So then later he's at a bar, and the show is comes on TV delayed. So the show was in the afternoon, and that evening when it's coming on, he's at a bar, and Johnny Carson's show comes on. And he's watching it at the bar, and people at the bar say, hey, that's you up there, isn't it? And they're all interested. And then when he makes that statement, people at the bar get angry, and some guy punches him and knocks, knocks him out. And, and he ends up going back in time and being able to do the investigation that he wanted to do in the book. He's able to go actually back in time and interview Peter and John and Paul and all these people. And, and, and uh, it was really, really fantastic book. That sounds great. This is a true story? Yeah, it's called the Christ Commission. <laughs> the Christ Commission, yeah. It's not a true story. It's a fictional novel, but it's really a great book of apologetics about the resurrection. Oh, I thought you meant it. I thought you said it was a true story. I was like, wow, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> well, <laughs> it sounds yeah. like a good story. It sounds good. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I don't know how we got off on that topic. Oh, yeah, you, you brought up... Uh, I'm good at digressing. What did you bring up? Uh, Zig Ziglar, yeah. Zig Ziglar, Ogmandino. Ogmandino wrote the Christ Commission. Okay, so he says, um, uh, uh, "What would our? Did I read that whole bottom part there? Adam, Adam after Adam sinned, God said, Cursed is the ground uh, because of you.' That Genesis 3:17. When the curse is reversed, we will no longer engage in painful toil." Verse 17. Uh, but will enjoy satisfying caretaking. No longer will the earth yield thorns and thistles, verse 18, defying our do dominion and repaying us for corrupting it. No longer will we return to the ground from which we were taken, verse 19, swallowed up in death as unrighteous stewards who ruined ourselves and the earth. Yeah. He says, our welfare is inseparable from the earth's welfare. Our destiny is inseparable from the earth's destiny. That's why the curse on mankind required that the earth be cursed and why the earth will also be resurrected when we are resurrected. The curse will be reversed. Man. Yeah, it's uh, uh, this resurrection and new creation, like... You know, Scripture says, I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm a new creature because I put my faith in Jesus. I'm born again, a child of God, regenerated. And when I die, I'll get resurrected with a glorified body that lives forever. And that's wonderful. But that's, that's just like me personally. When we look at not just mankind, but the earth and the universe is goes through the same kind of a process that I personally and you are going, going to go through. It's just, it's, it is so big. It's, to me, when we think of creation and the vastness of the universe, it's mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the size of the universe is, is just, you know, we talk in terms of light years, how many thousands of light years, the speed of light, how 286,000 miles per second light travels, and then in a year, how far does it go? And then 10,000, 100,000 light years to get to from one point, point A to point B in the universe. It's so vast, this creation. And then when we divide it down into, into the molecular level and we go down into these this uh, uh, dividing it half again and half again and half again into the smallest quantities of existence of, of, of matter, it, the size of it 
is so immense, it's mind-boggling, and all of that is creation, and yet it's all going to be recreated, renewed all over again to be perfect. Yep. <laughs> that's something that, I've. That's, that's something that's always gotten me too. I've always been a stargazer. And I, you know, I, I, I love, you know, looking through the telescope and, and looking at the stars and watching celestial things, you know, events and things. And it's, it's just amazing. You just, if you just lay there in the quiet and the peace, there's nothing like when I, when I would go, I went on a hunting trip with some friends one time and we just were out there and we're out there in the middle of nowhere and we're about to go to bed for the night. And it's the darkest dark you've ever, just imagine there's no lights, there's nothing. You're up here in the mountains and it's, there's nothing there. And you get to see, you know, get to see the sky in such a different way, and it's you just if you just sit there and just think, you know, and ponder it like a Christian would, you know, thinking about the immenseness of God's creation, just how big it is. It's overwhelming. It's you get lost in it. It really is. It's yeah. If you first ponder the size of the universe, uh, from using the scientific measurements of to how large it is. It is amazing. It, it will blow our minds if we, when we look at it that way. And then you reduce it down to what the Earth is, and then what you, Eric, are as an individual in this yeah. universe. Yeah, we're, we're almost a. Then we look at the value that God places on you, Eric, and of this entire universe. Uh, you're, you're, what you are in relation to the universe. And then what you are in relation to what God thinks of you and how his value he puts on mm -hmm. you is just amazing that God could love us and care for us that much when we look at what we are in all of creation. I mean, when you look at the detail of, of, of the human being in and of, in and of itself, you know, the, a person, a person is a universe unto themselves. <laughs> I mean, a when you cell down, is a universe under what, itself. Yeah, when, when yeah. You, yeah. I mean, when you get down, what, that's exactly right, Mitch. You know, it's so funny. We're learning things, and we constantly learn things in science where scientists have to go back and go, we were wrong about that. They go back and they looked at what they considered what they called simple cells, and they found out that they're not simple at all. These things, when you, we just couldn't see how complex they were until we developed the technology to be able to see how complex they were. What and do they so call that like, microscope now? Spectra? What is it? Oh, um, shoot. It's what uh, I know. It's on the tip of your tongue. I can't. I can't remember. But it's I a microscope exactly. that we can. Not many people have it. It's expensive, but no, you it can would blow see. your mind the level these things can see. And it's like it's it's just what like I said, what they thought was was simple is no is not simple. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and it's like, to me, I you know I I I made a video about this, just scratching the surface on it. But to me, for any person who understands the science of what we're talking about now and the 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 detail even within a, a cell a single cell the complexity of it how they could think that that is some kind of accident <laughs> random accident rather than rather than organized and created and planned and designed uh, it, it's just it's amazing to me the amount of stupidity a person has it, to have it, it to takes not recognize more, that it, it, I agree. it takes far more faith to believe that to believe that it's just some total accident and fluke that all these independent organs of your body and cells and all these things work work together for your life as a human being and all the amazing things the body can do. To, it takes more faith to believe that's an accident than it does believe there's an intelligence and there's a design behind it. You've argued with these people, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Of course. And then they'll go, oh, well, it wasn't a great design. Yeah, that's what oh, they'll try and tell you. Wasn't that good? Are you nuts? Oh. Okay, sure. <laughs> the eyeball alone, the things it can do, uh, would would it blows your mind. There's not a camera made that can do the things that the eyeball can do. It's it's yeah. it's. It's a great design, but before the fall, it was even better. It was even better. That's well, exactly. Well, that's what I said to the guy. Yeah. I said you're looking at the fallen side of it. That's that's exactly right, Mitch. That's exactly correct. Guy was I dumbfounded at that. I I argued him to the point where he was dumbfounded. But you know, it's. I think these atheists are actually Satanists. Oh yeah. Well, you know, the audience might not like my, my next statement, but this is uh, really the truth. This is this is an outlandish statement I'm going to make. Everybody who disagrees with us about Jesus and salvation are Satanists. Well, yeah, it's true. All religions of the world 
whether it's atheism or Buddhism or Mormonism or Roman Catholicism or any ism, any religious viewpoint about God or no God, it's all Satanism because mm -hmm. Satan is, is everything apart from true faith in Jesus Christ as That's your right. Savior. That's right. Absolutely. But a lot of these atheists, I'm wondering if they're actually Satanists to begin with. Especially since they, they follow, a lot of them follow Saul Alinsky's book, which is dedicated to Satan. I think some of them are. I think some of them are. And then you have the others that are simply, um, you know, it, it's a more comforting way to convince themselves that they don't have to believe in God so they don't have to change the way they live. Or they don't have to be a different person or don't have to look at, look at themselves as a bad person to begin with in order to realize they need a savior. So it, they, they don't want to have that realization. People don't like to have to look at themselves in that way. Maybe, say, but a, I have a, lot of people, a lot of people are going to be uh, just, they're, they're, they just don't know. And those no, that, people that I don't too. have a problem with. But when they say, no, that too. oh, we don't know, and you don't understand it, but, but then there's the, you can see that there's a political agenda behind it, you know that they're not being forthcoming. Right. You know right. that. All right. Um, as a result of the curse, the first Adam could no longer eat from the tree of life which presumably would have made him live forever in his sinful state, uh, Genesis 3.22. Uh, could you look that up, Eric? Sure. Uh, death, though a curse in itself, was also the only way out from the curse, and that only because God had come up with a way to defeat death and restore mankind's relationship with him. What does that Genesis 3.22 say? It says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. That's the beginning of it. It goes to another. Mm -hmm. another yeah, verse. and then he posted uh, angels or cherubim outside the, ga the gates of paradise. Right, therefore the Lord sent forth the, the Garden of Eden to till the he ground. He didn't want them to be able to go back in there. And eat the tree of life and live forever, but be right. live forever in sin <laughs> with, right. with a, you know fallen man. Uh, Christ came to remove the curse of sin and death. That's Romans eight two. Uh, he is the second Adam who will undo the damage wrought by the first Adam. In the cross and the resurrection, God made a way not only to restore His original design for mankind, but also to expand it. In our resurrection bodies, we will again dwell on earth, a new earth, completely free of the curse, unencumbered by sin. Humanity, uh, human activity will lead naturally to a prosperous and magnificent culture. Under the curse, human culture has not been eliminated, but it has been severely hampered by sin, death, and decay. Before the fall, Food was readily available with minimal labor. Time was available to pursue thoughtful, aesthetic ideas, to work for the sheer pleasure of it, to please and glorify God by developing skills and abilities. Since the fall, generations have lived and died after spending most of their productive years eking out an existence in the pursuit of food, shelter, and protection against theft and war. Mankind has been distracted and debilitated by sickness and sin. Our cultural development has likewise been stunted and twisted and sometimes misdirected, though not always. Even though our depravity means we have no virtue that makes us worthy of our standing before God, we are nevertheless, quote, made in God's likeness, unquote. Consequently, some things we do, even in our fallenness, such as painting, building, performing beautiful music, finding cures for diseases, and other cultural, scientific, commercial, and aesthetic pursuits, are good. Well, he, he stated it better than I did earlier, talking about... Uh, you know how difficult man's existence has been, and and, and how uh, uh, we take a lot for granted living in, you know, this century, in 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 this location of the earth where life is so easy compared to all our ancestors, and uh, and yet he says that in spite of that, man has still been able to do some things that probably are like maybe a remnant of of. Uh, 
our unfallen state, the ideas of creativity and trying to cure diseases and culture and some things that we still think uh, are beautiful. Mm. I want to make wine and cheese. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you know, in heaven I want my goats and I want my grapes, you know, and... Uh, there's no goats in heaven, there's only sheep. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got to be sheep's milk cheese, then. I don't know. I think there might be some goats up there. Sure. Yeah, look I, at that. Are you I, sure I, that I, I got a laugh out of someone? That was good. I like that one. That was good. There are no goats in heaven. Poor, the, poor, 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 the, the, the poor animal, the goat, you know, he gets a bad rap, doesn't he? Poor, he didn't do anything. It's not his fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why were goats even chosen for the dark side? That's because they have horns. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, you know the goat really is a satanic symbol too, right? Goat's head. Right. I'm just. Is it because they use they like use it for a, that. Such a like a bad comparison to a sheep. Like it's got it's got it's got stronger fur and it's got those horns and it's more crude than what a sheep would do. Well, what do you really? What are goats good for? I mean, do people have herds of goat and they use it for meat or milk or something? Is oh yeah. yeah, they're also really good for taming the pastures. They eat a lot of uh, weeds. Yeah, the garbage and they eat the junk and yeah. Yeah, so goats aren't all that bad. Oh, that's right. I've seen. I remember seeing goats eating tin cans on oh, cartoons. They'll, they'll eat anything. They'll eat all kinds of things. My aunt yeah. called a goat that used to eat cigarettes. You know, you know, goat milk is the most popular milk to drink in the whole world. More people drink goat than they drink cow. Are you? I mean, sure? I mean, in other words, cow and also cows have been uh, uh, a symbol of, of unrighteousness too, because that was the, the right. Type they're of what the Hindus worship. So they're not going to be in heaven either. I think the reason why the goat uh, symbol is is the is in a satanic thing isn't so much that the goat the goat was bad and as as a result. It's it's that I think so much as maybe that uh, Satanists embrace the idea that they're the goats and so they 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 embrace that image you know yeah. and so they use it. Yeah, I, I should we shouldn't be so hard on the cute little goats. Yeah, man, goats get a bad rap. They, they do. Those, <laughs> That's those, why I want to raise them in heaven. Those little I'll, kids. I'll take the goat cheese because I I love goat cheese. <laughs> Yeah. I never, I never had goat cheese. Oh, you're missing something. There's all different. I've, I've had it mixed with other things, like in certain foods. I've had like certain goat cheese products mixed with things in foods. I've had, yeah, it's pretty good. It's not bad. I, I like the harder goat, goat cheese. What does goat taste like? People eat goat. I've never had goat, but if with the kind of things they eat, I can't imagine they taste very good. Where did the saying uh, "get my goat" uh, come get from? My goat. I you know, like, you get my goat means it kind of, like, got me irritated or something. Yeah, I, I've never known where they got that from. I've, I've used the term myself, but <laughs> I don't know where it came from. Mm -hmm. Okay, the removal of the curse means that people, culture, the earth, and the universe will again be as God intended. The lifting of the curse comes at a terrible price. Quote, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, unquote, Galatians 3.13. God's law shows us how far short we fall, but Jesus took on himself the curse of sin, satisfying God's wrath by taking the curse upon himself and defeating it through his resurrection. Jesus guaranteed the lifting of the curse from mankind and from the earth. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, getting back to that complaint against Randy's uh, theology uh, from GES, you know that, that you you read something like this, and you read so much of what he has to say uh, in uh, these points, and it, it's so perfect. Uh, uh, but it's again, there's just a tiny bit of leaven every once in a while he includes there. Right. Yeah, those are the most. Okay, the removal the. Re I was going to say those are the most dangerous are the ones that act sincere because you know they make they make him they try to bleed you in by that oh that caring and all oh, man he, he means so well but man they have that devilish message and it'll take you straight to hell with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the removal of the curse will be as as thorough and sweeping as the redemptive work of Christ in bringing us salvation. Christ has already under undone some of the damage in our hearts. 
but in the end he will finally and completely restore his entire creation to what God originally intended. Christ will turn back the curse and restore to humanity all that we lost in Eden, and he will give us much more besides. Okay, uh, far as the curse is found, uh, Jesus came not only to save spirits from damnation, that would have been at most a partial victory. No, he came to save his whole creation from death. That means our bodies too, not just our spirits. It means the earth, not just humanity, and it means the universe not just the earth. Christ's victory over the curse will not be partial. Death will not just limp away wounded. It will be annihilated, utterly destroyed. Quote, God will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces he will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. Isaiah chapter 25. Makes me want to sing joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Yeah, you know, a lot of people don't even realize they sing that song, and it's actually about his second coming. It's about coming. It's about his his reign and his return. <laughs> yep. Let heaven and nature. Sing. They sing it during Christmas, but it's actually about about his second coming, his return mm -hmm. to the earth to establish his kingdom. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting you said that, Mitch. I know you don't have the book in front of you as Eric and I do, but this is the next sentence in the book. Isaac Watts' magnificent hymn, Joy to the World, <laughs> is theologically on target. <laughs> Uh, that's amazing. That is that is amazing. There is no coincidence. There's no coincidence. <laughs> and, you know, Eric, Eric, Mitch did not have the benefit of the book is in front of us. No, he either. did not. That was very good. That's, I think that's this. No I think this settles it beyond any doubt. Mitch does have psychotic powers. <laughs> psychotic. Psychotic. Thank you for telling me I'm psychotic. I really I'm appreciate it. Power. It must come from all the goat cheese. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, he says uh, that, that in that joy of the world, he says, "No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground." He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. And real quick, I would suggest, I'm glad you're reading that part because people only go so far in that song. They really need to go read all the words of that song. It's a really beautiful song. And they need to get the whole, because it's actually a much larger song that we, that we experienced during Christmas time. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, verses yeah. there. Yeah, I've never really thought of that uh, song or hymn uh, regarding salvation. Uh, more it's about his, his, his birth. And I mm -hmm. thought it was about his his birth as a child not as his not as his second coming but because I don't I've, as you said I've never really known the whole song but I have a playlist called hymns uh, and actually it's not just not a playlist it's a uh, it's a hangout show like this where we're discussing some of the old hymns and some of the old hymns that's discrimination Luke there what? should be hers you have all these hymns you don't have hers yeah, that's true. What are we going to do about that? Well, you know the the Bible is definitely a sexist book, right? Yes, I do. Oh, of course. Well, that's not no, that's not fair because you know, Mitch, you're not right. The hers get hurricanes. They get hurricanes. There's no hurricanes, so we should get. We we yeah, you're right. You know, they, we they have hymns. They get the hurricanes. <laughs> I don't want to get a hearse. That's all I don't want to get. Oh, that's. <laughs> okay, but my my point about these uh, these uh, old hymns is that the. Um, uh, how great thou art, old rugged mm -hmm. cross, uh, bless. Um, um, uh, obviously, uh, um, uh, gosh, what's the what's the most popular one? Uh, uh, oh shoot, Ned. Uh, Jingle bells. I like shoot. that. <laughs> Uh, Amazing Grace. Amazing there Grace. There we go. All, all of these hymns 
if you really were to just forget the song for a moment and just read the words and study the words of them, uh, they really do present the theology of uh, salvation more clearly than most uh, pastors do from the, in the churches. <laughs> okay, so he says, God will lift the curse, not only morally in terms of sins and psychologically in terms of sorrows, but also physically in terms of thorns in the ground. How far does Christ's redemptive work extend? Far as the curse is found. If redemption failed to reach the farthest boundaries of the curse, it would be incomplete. The God who rules the world with truth and grace won't be satisfied until every sin, every sorrow, every thorn is reckoned with. Yeah, it's uh, really a, it's just another example of the fact that... Uh, uh, I, I, and even on the panel, I'm not sure all of us have even thought it through this this extensively, uh, but I think the church as a whole has no idea how thorough this redemption is, how far the removal of the curse extends, as, as he's mentioning here, and that we're going to go in the future chapters and really discuss this remedy, how complete the remedy is, this blood of Jesus. But we can't know because we weren't, we weren't in paradise with Adam and Eve. We, can, we see signs of it. We see this earth the way it should be. We have an idea of what, what the world should be like, but it's not that way. You know, um, and, and life on, on this planet has always been toil, has always been strife to a great degree. And so we, we don't have anything really to compare it to, as, mm -hmm. as Adam and Eve did. Well, like what we do is, we, we, uh, I've said this before, but if you were to take the most beautiful scenery in the earth, and, you know, uh, as some people have traveled, some people watch it on Nat National Geographic, and, and some people get it on on videos, uh, you know, emails where someone said, look at these pictures of the most beautiful waterfalls in the world or, or whatever. You know, we've all seen these most beautiful things. Well, I've got Chiriki on my, on my desktop, Panama. It's pretty good, but I kind of like Norway, but only in the summertime. Yeah, so these these things that are the most beautiful things we see on the earth today, these are like little glimpses and shadows of, of, of paradise as it was, and as, as we and paradise that will come. Uh, it, it's going to be like the most beautiful scenery on earth. It'll be like that, but better everywhere all the time. Yep. It's, I'm just, I'm so excited about it. Mm -hmm. You know? That's a good idea. <laughs> In the Reformed tradition, Albert Walters embraces an expansive, redemptive world view. Quote, Biblical religion views the whole course of history as a movement from a garden to a city, and it fundamentally affirms that movement. Redemption in Jesus Christ reaches just as far as the fall. The horizon of creation is at the very at, at the same time the horizon of sin and self and of salvation. To conceive of either the fall of Christ's deliverance as encompassing less than the whole of creation is to compromise the biblical teaching of the radical nature of the fall and the cosmic scope of redemption. So when we understand how great the fall is then we can better understand how great and vast redemption is. Well, we do have a glimpse of it here, but we're always wishing, like, wouldn't it be better if we didn't have to have, uh, like, all the stresses of life on us and we could actually enjoy it? Tons of us go on vacation, right? And by the time we get done with our vacation, we need a vacation from our vacation because it's so stressful. <laughs> right. You know, but imagine actually having a real vacation. That would be what it, I would say in a perpetual vacation, where you don't have the stresses of vacation, where the things in life that you went on vacation for you can actually realize. Now that, that would be good. I think there's another side to that too, which is that you go on vacation knowing that one day the vacation is going to be over and you got to come back to all the toil and everything else you got to do. So it's like, you know, but but that's what you tell people. Say, right? Well, that's heaven. It's the vacation you never return from. It's it's the it's there is no coming back. The, Why go on a no, vacation? It's a tease anyway. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, That's why even, I live in San Diego. Even the best vacations, you know, to me, I, I don't yep. travel. I don't travel. It's physically, it's very hard for me. My, my body aches all the time, and traveling just makes it worse. And uh, but when I if, when I get into this uh, eternal vacation, you know, if I want to travel, I'm not going to have an achy body to deal with. <laughs> well, you won't be tired. I do right. want there to be a nightlife. This kind of bothers me about daytime all the time. I gotta like take issue with it. Can you just like put a little darkness down with some lights? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jesus came not only to rescue people from ultimate destruction. He came also to rescue the entire universe from ultimate destruction. He will transform our dying earth into a vital new earth fresh and uncontaminated, no longer subject to death and destruction. The curse is real, but it, it is temporary. Jesus is the cure for the curse. And I've noticed here also the words cure and curse, uh, they're the same except for that letter S, which stands for serpent. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. Uh, he came to set, to set derailed... Uh, human history back on its tracks. Earth won't be put out of its misery. It will be infused with a greater life than it has ever known, at last becoming all that God meant for it to be. Uh, we have never seen the Earth as God made it. Our planet as we know it is a shadowy half-tone image of the original, but it does whet our appetites for the new Earth, doesn't it? If the present earth, so diminished by the curse, is at times so beautiful and wonderful, if our bodies, so diminished by the curse, are at times overcome with a sense of the earth's beauty and wonder, then how magnificent will the new earth be? And what will it be like to experience the new earth in something else we've, all, we've never known? Perfect bodies. That's just what we've been talking about. A mature Christian Bible student wrote me a note after reading a draft of this book. Quote, I realize now that I have always thought that when we die, we go immediately to our eternal home. After I was there, now that would be the end of the story. I wouldn't care about what happened to earth and everything on it. Why should I care about a doomed planet? Without Christ, both the earth and mankind would be doomed. But Christ came, died, and rose from the grave. He brought deliverance, not destruction. Because of Christ, we are not doomed, and neither is the earth. Earth cannot be delivered from the curse by being destroyed. It can only be delivered by being resurrected. As we'll see in the next section, Christ's resurrection is the forerunner of our own, and our resurrection is the forerunner of the earth's. Wow. Okay, so that's we'll uh, we'll uh, go into chapter eleven uh, when we pick up next time. Uh, let's use the remaining time to kind of uh, emphasize any key points and make conclusions here. Uh, I think that this point that uh, he just made in the last paragraph is a really important point that uh, uh, our resurrection it will preclude the Earth's resurrection. So we know that um, there, as we see this timeline, um, we've got this fallen world and fallen man, and then you've got some individuals like us, who knows how many. Are there a thousand saved people in the world? A million? A billion? Who knows how many are saved living on the earth right now? That we are redeemed, and we are regenerated as a child of God, and but as we die, there will come a time when he calls us up, resurrects us, gives us these glorified bodies, and and then after that happens, the earth will also go through the same kind of situation where the earth will undergo a resurrection so that it's prepared for us to live on it in a, in a perfect paradise forever. So do you think that that's a that's a pretty interesting way to, uh, to look at this uh, idea of resurrection? I think it makes perfect sense. And when you look at resurrection, the way God, God, I've mentioned this before, but God doesn't make anything 
just for the sake of making it. He doesn't do that. Everything he creates have a purpose. So everything he created in the universe, the planets, the galaxies, the earth, the trees, the mountains, the, everything he made was for a purpose. It wasn't just for the sake of making it so he could just get rid of it one day. That's not the way he works. Um, everything he makes is precious. And in that regard, it should be preserved, and he wants it to be preserved. And that speaks volumes to the fact that there's only one option, and that option is that God is going to restore what he once made as good, and not only restore it, but make it even better. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder if this goes to beauty, that people just don't see the beauty in a flower. They don't catch the beauty in the wind. Or, or a bird that flies, or a butterfly. You know, it, it seems to me like they kind of think that heaven's going to be this cosmic place where all of that's not going to be there. Why wouldn't it be? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, everybody knows I like to golf, and sometimes in a golf course, you know, there's a lot of beauty around. Uh, I, I have friends I golf with, and there's some people I've golfed with in the past where uh, if you have to wait for the group ahead of you, some people get impatient. And they want it's one guy I used to golf with says, let's let's find an open hole. Let's drive and find some open hole and jump ahead of them or something. And uh, so we don't have to wait. And I said, part of the wonder of, of this is is these times when you can wait and you look at the beauty of the golf course and you and you talk to each other and you enjoy your company, you know. Uh, you, you know that saying, "Stop and smell the flowers." You know, hey, there's flowers all around. Won't you enjoy them? And, and, and you know the beauty of it. So and nobody uh, does that. They're, they're, they're my, and, and yeah. I think that that makes them have a short-sighted idea of heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, it's interesting. It's when I, I started getting into photography a little bit, and it's funny Mitch said that about the flowers because when you start getting to some of these lenses where you can capture these really close images of some of the flowers and their colors they just pop and these the way these colors Jesus says it and you know, Solomon and all his glory was not arrayed as any of these you know um, the the complexity of those little things we talk about the body but the, but the inside you you get these things and look at them close up and the complexity of these all the work that went into the, the art God is a master artist he's a oh, he's majorly a, but even he's beyond the master what we think. Uh, you know, oh, I absolutely used work, I used to work in a garden center and you know what hooked me on the roses the smell. They all have different scents, mm -hmm. and bees have different sight. They see they see the ultraviolet like uh, mm -hmm. of a flower. I mean, there's such things that we don't even see that God created. But what it was like there there was one type of rose, type of tea rose, and floribunda roses, and 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 and, and uh, you know climbing roses. But they a lot of them had scents. They had different smells to them. And they were distinct. Oh, I love the smell of a purple rose. Oh, wow. When I started to do that, that's when I really started to appreciate roses. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, uh, each person make like a final uh, comment here, and then, then we'll end the, the show. Uh, Austin, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> great. Uh, it's a good show. Get rid of the curse and the, well, how tremendous sacrifice Jesus did to uh, <clears throat> get rid of that partition between us, you know, to reunite us with the, with the Father. What a great uh, gift that is. Uh, I, I'll leave it at this verse. I, I was going to say it earlier on because I heard somebody say value, and, it may, and I remember this verse. It was Matthew 10, 31, and it stated, Fear ye not, therefore ye are of more value than sparrows. And it was just to show that God loves you so much that, uh, you know, he wants everybody back, not willing that any should perish all should come to repentance towards him in uh, in faith in Jesus Christ so it's just uh, it's a wonderful thing and uh, to know that he loves you that much that even though while we were yet sinners uh, Christ died for us so uh, thank you for the show brother Luke and uh, pray that uh, someone will uh, hear that message amen thank you thank you I appreciate you joining us uh, brother Austin okay Eric you know, I think sometimes people get a little discouraged, and that's why they get a, a bad idea about heaven is because a little bit about what we just talked about. They feel that they'll be leaving some of these things behind that we just talked about, like Mitch talked about and I was talking about and Austin was saying. Um, the, the beauty of flowers, the smell of them, the wind, the, the, the sound of the ocean, you know, uh, the peaceful peacefulness of sitting there hearing the waves lap against the beach. And they feel like 
leaving the earth to go to heaven is leaving all those things behind. But it's not leaving all those things behind. God created those things and made those things, at least I believe, and I believe the Bible confirms this, that he made those things for us to enjoy. Not only because we enjoy them, he enjoys them. He made them that way, not just for our enjoyment, because he enjoys what he created. And why would he create something so enjoyable to only take it away? If that's your feeling, you have a wrong feeling. It's Those joys are going to be there. They were made for a reason, and they weren't meet, made so that God could show us these things and then snatch them away from us. That's not joy. That's not that's not enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, uh, Brother Mitch. You know, I would just ditto what Eric just said. I mean, he said that so well. Yeah, you're you're think... always safe in doing that with Eric, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, why not? I mean, but but it's true that that, that heaven is a place. Beyond, you know, and, and, and it's there's beaches and, and 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 mountains and shores and amusement parks probably, not that I know completely, but it is a place, a place where you can go, where all the places that you couldn't completely enjoy, or the little bit of joy that you snatched or stolen on the earth that you you, you kind of got from looking at the good architecture of some beautiful houses or whatnot. You know, you were never able to buy those houses. Now you can walk into them, enjoy them. They're like they're yours. You were never able to to, to, to completely enjoy life because of all of the, the problems that, 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 that there is in life. But now the new heaven is this place where all of that, that stuff that, that, that takes away our joy, we see the joy in front of us, but we can't, attain to it because there's so much sin and so much problems on the earth, that joy is attainable forever through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, next time we're going to pick up in chapter 11, and the question asked is, why is resurrection so important? Um, and uh, we've talked about uh, not only is this, uh, this pertain to this uh, Renewal, this resurrection is not only for man and our bodies, but also for the earth and for all the whole universe. This restoration will happen. Now, for anybody watching this, uh, if you're getting excited about heaven, I, I hope you are, because uh, it's it's going to be the, the joy of being in heaven forever is going to is beyond our wildest dreams, and, and we want you to be able to enjoy that too, and. Uh, uh, there's there's only one thing that you're required to do so that you can partake of this and, and have eternal life in the kingdom of God, this new new heavens and new earth where it's going to be so beautiful and and just everything wonderful forever and ever. There's only one thing that you're required so that you can participate in that and have it, and that is that you put your faith in Jesus Christ completely. Now, I know that a lot of people watching this show is, are saying, well, I have faith. I have a lot of faith. And uh, I'm sure that many people watching this do have faith. But I want to make sure your faith is uh, directed correctly. Do not put your faith in your own ability to, to live a good life and be a good person. And somehow, if you're good enough, God, you, God will be pleased and give you heaven. That's not, no one can do that. If you could do that, Jesus would not have had to come here and die for our sins if, if man could solve the problem on his own. So please, do not put your faith in yourself. Do not put your faith in any of the religions of the world. They'll all fail you. If the religions of the world could save you, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die for our sins. I'm asking you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Make Jesus the object of your faith. Believe that, that he is God and he loves you so much, he came to this world and became a man so he could die for your sins. And he did. He died for the sins of the whole world. So now, sin is not a barrier between man and God anymore. You can have a relationship with God. Jesus Christ is this God Almighty, manifest in the flesh as a man. And you can have the relationship with him because he paid for your sins. All, all that's required of you is that you reject everything else and instead put your faith entirely in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, is he worthy of your faith? Can you? Why should you trust Jesus? Because he raised himself from the dead. By, by raising himself from the dead, 
he proved that he is God, he proved that he has the power over life and death, and he is worthy of our faith. You're justified in putting your faith in Jesus because he raised himself from the dead. So uh, depend on him and, and reject everything else. Understand you're helpless and hopeless and you need Jesus Christ to save you. And once you do, he gives you eternal life right then and you could never lose it for any reason. If you do that, let us know. We want to celebrate with you. Make a comment on this video and uh, we want to know uh, if, if you're going to be joining us on the new heavens and the new earth in eternity. I want to thank all the panelists for joining me again. And uh, uh, everybody watching this, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen.